Welcome to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, and thank you for being a part of our television ministry. Pulaski Heights is a place of warmth and love, with an outreach mission that extends far beyond our church walls. We have a long tradition of offering our hearts, stretching our minds, and extending Christ's hands to those in need. We are a congregation of hope and an open place of worship that seeks to share the good news beyond the conventional barriers of fellowship. Good morning and welcome to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. My name is John Robbins. We are thankful for your presence, those watching on television and those watching online. We are grateful that you would choose to be a part of this service of worship. In just a few moments, I'll be talking about the authority of Jesus Christ. But we invite you at this time to be a part of the entire service of worship as we enjoy together the joy of being followers of Jesus Christ.
creatures and ye holy ones, bright seraphs, cherubim, and thrones, raise the glad strain. Powers, virtues, archangels, angels, choirs, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. our God, says the psalmist, and greatly to be praised. For God has stretched the heavens above and filled the earth with every good thing. We live and move and have our being in God, and in him is our everlasting hope. Let us worship God by sharing the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Amen. Amen. From Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever. To be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Lord of all hopefulness, 
hast, Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no cares could destroy. Be there a little waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the and girls, come gather around the screen as we sing. so glad to be worshiping with you today. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been to a lake or a pond when the water was completely calm or still? I have, and when that's happened, you know what I've wanted to do? I've wanted to go up to the edge of the water and touch it, or maybe pick up a rock and throw it into the water. You know, when we touch the water or throw a rock into the water, there's a little tiny circle where we touch it. And that circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's called a ripple effect. Well, did you know that our actions and our words have an effect too? It has effect on people's feelings. We can either cause a kind ripple or we can cause a hurtful ripple. Let's say, for example, I smile at three people. 
I feel good, and those three people feel good, and if they feel good, they might go out and smile at other people. Just like that, my one decision to be kind has caused a kindness ripple. Now say, what if I'm feeling really grumpy and I say something very hurtful to somebody? Well, that makes that person feel not so good, doesn't it? And if that person doesn't feel good, they may go out and be kind of grumpy and unkind to someone else. We're kind of passing on the grumpies then. That's an unkind ripple. But do you know what? You can stop an unkind ripple. All you have to do is really think and pull from your heart and decide, I want to be kind. And instead, say something and do something kind. And that stops that unkind ripple right then and there. The Bible tells us that in everything Jesus did and taught, he said to love one another. So if we want to follow Jesus, we need to spread kind ripples, don't we? So the next time you say something or do something, I want you to stop and think. Think about whether you're going to send a kind ripple out or a hurtful ripple out. We want to follow Jesus by sending kind ripples out into the world that spread God's love. Please join me together in a prayer. Dear God, we thank you so very much for your son Jesus who taught us to love one another. Help us be mindful and remember to follow him. We need to spread kind ripples out into the world. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. I hope you have a great week. Please receive our joys and concerns of this past week. We pray for all experiencing grief and loss this day, and our Christian sympathy is extended to Sarah Cook and family in the death of her father, David Wells, to Kelly Kreff and family in the death of his father, Dr. Keith Kreff, to Dr. Lyndall York and family in the death of his wife, Carolyn York, to Randy Moreau and family in the death of his mother, Lou Moreau, to the family and friends of Clarinda Hall in her recent death, to Dorothy Holland and family in the death of her husband, O.L. Holland, and to Stephanie Hayes, Mark Haynes, and their families in the death of their uncle, Paul Culpepper. We pray for all who are ill or recently hospitalized, including Will Gant, Joe Litch, Chris Marine, Charlotte Staggs, Edwina Wilson, Molly Vanderveer, and Barbara Wilkins. And we rejoice in the birth of Ryder James Goff, child of Nikki and Taylor Goff, and great-grandchild of Sarah Harrison. And we rejoice in the baptism of Caroline K. Coleman, child of Lindsay and Jacob Coleman. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. God of all creation, today we come seeking you with the full knowledge that you are able and ready to respond to our supplications. We invite you into our hearts and minds during these quiet moments of thanksgiving and reflection. Help us to set aside any distractions that would keep us from resting in your presence. Hear our prayers for the world, for individuals, children, and families. Hear our prayers for those who hunger and live in poverty, for the oppressed, for those suffering pandemic fatigue, and those struggling with addictions. Bring healing to all wounds. Make whole all that is broken and shed light into darkness. Bless your church, O oh God, and teach us to always trust in your care and live one day at a time. Continue to fill us with faith that does not disappoint and love that bears all things as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer taught throughout generations that we continue to teach and to share with generations to come. Because you give, the children and youth of our church not only are able to learn the traditions of our faith, but also to come together to live their faith in action. Even in this time of COVID, our youth have been meeting socially distanced, and this week they put together 500 care bags that will be passed out at drive through communion as we seek to share the love of Christ with our world through these bags of food and provision for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Because you give, young people are learning the power of God's love, grace, and authority in their lives, and they're calling to be part of God's work in the world. If you would like to be a part of the work of teaching our youth and serving our world, you can make a donation to Belaski Heights via text, online, or by mail by following the information that appears on your screen. And now as we offer our gifts to God in this time of worship, will you join me in prayer? Awesome God, you sent Jesus to teach people firsthand the power of your love, grace, and authority Jesus washed away unclean spirits and performed countless other miracles so that even the faithless would experience your love. You call us to be mindful and vigilant of the extraordinary miracles that you continue to work in our lives today. May this offering undergird ministries that show others your miraculous love, grace, and authority. We pray in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Please join in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God who created the world and filled it with awesome beauty. I believe in Christ whose resurrection has changed the way we look at life and death. I believe in the Holy Spirit whose presence enables me to sing and laugh at misfortunes. I believe that God has manifested himself or herself in these three ways and in many other ways besides and that this manifestation continues wherever I am and wherever happens to be, as long as I have eyes to see and ears to hear. And because I believe in God, I believe in prayer, which is the way I listen and hear God speaking, and the way I learn to serve God in the world. I am here today in order to pray, and when I have prayed, I believe that my life will be stronger better and more centered in God's will. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we read from God's holy word today from chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark, beginning ver with verse 21. I invite you to hear these holy words. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We again say a word of greeting. We're thankful for your presence, sharing with us as a part of Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church in the joy of being followers of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. Peter Cartwright was a Methodist circuit-riding preacher in the 19th century. He received celebrity status because he was a pistol-toting, no-nonsense kind of preacher. He didn't put up with the rowdy folk. He was an intimidating figure in a variety of ways. On one occasion, while Cartwright was preaching outdoors, there was a heckler who kept interrupting his sermon. Cartwright believed he had the authority to do whatever he needed to do to maintain order in a service of worship. He believed that authority came to him from the church 
As a Methodist circuit riding preacher, he was ordained to preach the word and administer the sacraments, and no one he believed had a right to interrupt his preaching. As this heckler kept making noise, Cartwright had enough. He stepped down from the podium, walked over to the man, punched him in the face, knocking him down. He got on top of him and began punching him all the more until the man asked for mercy. And when he asked for mercy, Cartwright said, I'll get off of you and stop punching you when you repent. In the moment the man suddenly repented of his sin, Cartwright got up, walked back up on the podium, and continued his sermon. Jesus was interrupted one time when he was teaching, but it was in stark contrast that is his response to the heckler, if you will, from that of Cartwright. Jesus is in the synagogue one day on the Sabbath in Capernaum. He is teaching, and people, scriptures say, are astounded by him. He preaches and he teaches as one who has authority. That means power and might and influence in every word that he offers up. While he is teaching, suddenly his teaching is interrupted by a man who is demon-possessed. The demons in this man know exactly who Jesus is. In fact, they call him the Holy One of God. And in the moment, Jesus uses his authority. And suddenly, this man begins to convulse. The demon is cast out of him when Jesus tells him to be silent. And the man is free from that which had tormented him. Jesus used his authority to heal, to teach. People were astounded, astonished, amazed, says the scripture, at how it is Jesus used the authority he had to do so much good. Jesus had the authority. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus' authority was like no other because Jesus, being God in flesh, had the power to share his authority in a different way, a dramatic way, a life-changing kind of way. And interestingly enough, when we read the Gospels and each occasion when Jesus confronts the demons, the demons know exactly who he is, the Holy One of God. They understand his authority. And in this teaching and in this exorcism, Jesus shows his authority to use it for good. As Jesus goes about living life and sharing his ministry with others, Jesus did not use his authority in a self-aggrandizement sort of way. That is to elevate himself in such a way that he was superior to everyone else. He didn't use his authority to intimidate those who were in need. On the contrary, Jesus taught us and showed that we are to use authority in service to those who are in need. Here is a man who is demon-possessed, and Jesus uses the authority that he has to cast out the demon and give the man new life. Jesus has the authority to teach in such a way that people are taken with every word that he utters, and their lives are changed as a result. Jesus used his authority so often in a selfless sort of way to make a difference in the lives of other people for the good. Jesus taught, taught us a lot about how to use authority. Many of us have authority. In fact, all of us at one time or another have had authority or power over other people 
either in our job or in our own home. On some occasion, we've had authority. How have we used that authority? For the betterment of the cause? Or have we used it to take advantage of other people, to intimidate, to overpower? Jesus used it for good. Remember that Jesus used his authority and showed his authority in the feeding of the 5,000. People who were hungry, he used his power to feed them. Jesus used his authority in varieties of ways to make a difference in the lives of those who needed his healing power as well. And Jesus, of course, used his authority to restore the lives of those who were broken, and we are called to do the same, to use our authority, whatever it may be, to bring about healing in a broken world, to share the words of Jesus Christ with others so that they may claim them for themselves and find hope in the midst of such difficulty and in the midst of so many challenges. Jesus restored the life of a woman caught in the act of adultery. He condemns her act, but he gives her another chance at restoration. Peter denies Jesus three times, but Jesus gives Peter a chance to be in a right relationship with our Lord all over again. Jesus took the authority that he had, and he used it for great good. And we are called to do the same, to show our authority and service in the world in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we abuse or misuse our authority, somebody is going to be hurt and somebody will suffer in some way. Jesus never misused or abused his authority, neither should we. There's a story in the Old Testament in 1 Kings about Ahab, who was the king. Ahab sees a vineyard that he really wants, but Naboth owns the vineyard. Ahab approaches Naboth and says, I want to buy your vineyard. But Naboth says, well, I don't want to sell it. It's been in my family for generations. I don't think I'll sell it. Ahab says, I'll give you a great price. But Naboth says, I appreciate the offer, king, but I'm going to keep it. It's been in the family a long, long time. Ahab goes back and begins to sulk like a four-year-old. His wife Jezebel asks him, Ahab, why are you acting this way? And Ahab says, I wanted a vineyard and I didn't get it. She said, you're the king. Use your authority. If you want the vineyard, you can have it. So Jezebel hatches a plan. Naboth is invited to a dinner. Jezebel tells two at the dinner to make an accusation against Naboth that he has cursed the king and he has cursed the name of God and as a result should be put to death. As scripture says, the two scoundrels make a false accusation about Naboth and Naboth is stoned to death for cursing the king and for cursing God. Ahab thinks he's got what he wants with no repercussions. But that's not how the story goes. Ahab gets the vineyard. But shortly after that, Ahab is killed by a wayward arrow. And not long after that, Jezebel herself is eaten by a pack of dogs. And that is the punishment they received for using their authority to manipulate and to wound and to kill. Jesus used his authority to be able to teach so that he could not only inform, but he could transform as well. Changing the lives of those who heard his message. The Gospel of Mark tells us when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, the crowd was astounded at his teaching. Not like anyone else. He taught with authority. 
Of course he did because he was and is and will always be the authority. And for us, the example of how to use power and might and influence for the greater good of the kingdom of God. There have been many people throughout the centuries who have said, Jesus was just a great teacher. He could draw in a crowd of people because he was a charismatic personality and such a great teacher and influencer of people. Kind of like Confucius or Mahatma Gandhi. There are others who say Jesus could draw such a crowd because he was an incredible preacher but nothing else. Outside of that, no different from anybody else, just a charismatic person who with his words could influence, kind of like Martin Luther King Jr. or Billy Graham. But we know that Confucius and Gandhi and MLK and Billy Graham all pale in comparison to Jesus Christ when it comes to his authority and his power and his might and his teaching ability, and his preaching ability, and his capability of healing those who are in need. We are called to take the authority that we have been given, whatever authority that may be, and to use that authority like Jesus as our example to transform the lives of those we encounter to use whatever power or influence we may have for the greater good. And if we don't use it for the greater good, we end up using it in a harmful way. Early in my ministry, I was on staff of a very large United Methodist Church. It was a very influential congregation a very visible congregation. And a lot of that had to do with the senior pastor of that congregation. I was in a staff meeting one day when this particular pastor began to unload his anger on a fellow pastor in front of the staff. In my opinion, it was completely inappropriate. It was an abuse of power. It was demeaning and humiliating and degrading, and he was relentless. This person who received this kind of treatment had an office next to mine. He was devastated and humiliated. And I remember making a promise to myself that if I ever have any kind of authority or power in the church as a pastor, if I ever have a staff, I will never abuse my power or authority. I will never mistreat or humiliate or denigrate anyone. It's easy sometimes to get angry it's easy sometimes to be frustrated and to abuse the position we have. But we have a model in terms of how we are to live life as good, faithful servants. That model is Jesus Christ. This one named Jesus is the authority that we live under. And it is his authority that we emulate, that we live out that we follow as well. All of us are in a position of power at one time or another. Many of us have tremendous power right now in our places of employment or in our own home as a parent or a spouse. Many people have power in the community in a variety of ways. They have influence, they have authority. How do we use that power and that authority for the greater good? Do we think before we respond? Do we make sure that what we are doing like Jesus somehow how can bring about healing or hope or assurance so that when we speak, people are astounded at the authority we have and how we use it for the greater good? 
I remember reading in a book entitled Seven Women by Eric Metaxas, a section in the book on Mother Teresa. There was an occasion when Mother Teresa got on a Pan Am flight. While she was sitting on the plane, the co-pilot stepped out, this was before 9-11, and on the microphone said, we have a special person on our flight. It is Mother Teresa of Calcutta. There was applause on the plane. And then the co-pilot took off his hat and began down to walk down the middle aisle of the plane asking people to make a donation to support the ministries of Mother Teresa. He collected more than $600 for her on that flight. It's because people understood that Mother Teresa was a celebrity, but she used her authority as a celebrity to do great good, to bring about healing and hope for those who were suffering. If a co-pilot had offered up my name, John Robbins is on the flight and passed around a hat, there'd probably be a couple of peanut wrappers and maybe an empty can of Coke in the hat. But for Mother Teresa, People had respect for her and an appreciation for her because she used her celebrity and her influence to bring about healing in a broken world. We are called to do the same thing. I love the fact that Jesus took the power that he had, was willing to encounter people who were powerless, people who were suffering, people who were in need, and Jesus used his power, his influence, his authority given to him in such a way that they were given life in the process. Like Mother Teresa, we are to use our authority to heal a broken world, to teach what love looks like, and to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. Like Jesus, we are to use our authority to heal, to serve, to restore, to renew those who are broken and in need of wholeness and healing. We have been given that authority the moment we claimed Christ as Lord, to offer up his love, to share the good news of salvation, to make a difference in the world driven by the love we have for him and the love he has for us. The good news for all of us is that we have authority and we have power and we have influence. And collectively, as the church of Jesus Christ, we have the capability of making an extraordinary difference in the world. So let us go and let us serve, and may we use our authority like Jesus to bring healing to this broken world. Hallelujah. Amen. As we do at the conclusion of every service of worship, we now extend an invitation to those who are watching our service online or on television to consider being a part of Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church in a formal way we would very much like for you to be a part of our faith community. You can contact the church office via email or with a phone call, and we will be in contact with you and share the joy of being in relationship with Jesus Christ with you. If you need information about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, we are happy to provide that as well. We want to remind you that we have a Wednesday evening Bible study on Facebook and YouTube at 6.30 on the Gospel of John that I teach. On Thursday evening at 6 o'clock, we have our contemporary service of worship on Facebook and YouTube. We hope you'll tune into that as well and share in that powerful worship experience. Whatever you choose to do and however you choose to do that, if you want to be a part of Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, we want you to be a part of this faith community. So we invite you to stand now as we sing together our closing hymn.
cup melts on of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming so excited to welcome new members into our family of faith. We welcome Mike and Rosemary Davis and Allison and Gary Nash and their nine-month-old son, Wilton, who decided they would like to commit to being a part of this family of faith here at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. Will you join me in welcoming them with this response for new members? We rejoice to recognize you as a member of Christ's Holy Church, and we welcome you to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Thank you for being a part of this service of worship. So we say to all of you, God bless you. Have a great week. Walk with Jesus and tell somebody about Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church.
thank you for joining us today at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. And I hope you enjoyed our worship service. May the peace, joy, and love of God be with you.